I believe it's a wonderful message. I just hope and pray I can get it out today in a way that will please the Lord and bless you. If you have your Bibles today, how in the world did that change already? <laughs> I guess the Lord sent an angel to help me. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, and you'd open them with me to Galatians chapter 4. And I'm reaching for my glasses, and I forgot I don't have them. Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, reading through verse 4. And this is, interestingly enough, another message that's kind of in the vein of Christmas. So it also is something of a pre-Christmas message. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 4, it'll be a little bit easier for me to read off the laptop today. And the King James text reads as we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Now I say this, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors, until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment this afternoon. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place in spite of our tired bodies, our weary minds. We've come into the house of God today with an expectation to hear from you, not merely to hear a sermonette for Christianettes. We're not here, Lord, to hear anything that I might have to say, but we're here that we might receive a word from heaven. We ask God today that you would anoint the messenger, anoint my weary body, quicken my mind, Lord, and refresh my soul, that I might deliver unto the people of God this precious, encouraging, uplifting word that you have given me for this moment. And Master, I ask God that you would as well touch every ear, that each and every person in this room, every person that might be watching by reason of the internet, now live, and those who will watch later, we pray, God, that that same anointing, that same presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place as the Word of God goes forth. Let that same anointing touch every hearer near and afar. We ask it all in that precious name, Jesus. Amen. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Sometimes it's all about timing. It's all about timing. Sometimes, sometimes you can do or say just the right thing at the right time. You know, the Bible says, for instance, a word fitly spoken is as apples of gold. A word fitly spoken, the right word at the right time, can make all the difference in the world. Lisa was talking just yesterday uh, about doing a funeral one time for a child. And it was kind of thrust upon her. She didn't have a lot of time to prepare. I'm going to tell you, as a preacher, been there, done that. <laughs> That's not fun when all of a sudden you're told ten minutes before a funeral that you're the only person available to preach the funeral, you know. And you've got to come up with something. And you're saying, Lord, what am I going to say? Especially when the child's involved. Dear God, that's tough stuff. What do I say to these people? What do I tell them? And she said that an inspiration came to her and that she was able to get up in the pulpit and talk about how we are often, you know, inclined to ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why 
did this occur? And she said that the Lord kind of laid on her heart that to tell the people, instead of asking why, what we need to ask is, what now? What do we do from here? Where do we go from that, from this position? And how people came to her afterwards and said, thank you for that. I've never had, nobody's ever approached things from that perspective. And that really helped me. And that really encouraged me. I'm going to tell you, sometimes the word fitly spoken, the right word at the right time can make all the difference in the world. Well, and then there's those times, I don't know if you're like me or not, I live about, oh, 80% of the time with my foot planted right in my mouth. Y'all been around me enough, you know how I do. I don't know, it's just nervous energy with me. People think I'm just so full of confidence, you know, when everybody thinks that this old boy is just so cocky and confident. A lot of that's put on because inside of this guy is a very insecure very out of place boy. I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm bearing my soul to y'all. I'm telling you the truth. And my nervous internal energy sometimes will have me say the dumbest things. I mean to tell you, I'll say the stupidest thing at the stupidest time. And then later I'll go home and I'm just red faced and wanting to bury my head in the sand because Lisa, I did it again, you know. As Brittany said, whoops, I did it again. Put my foot in my mouth. Now I got an athlete's foot in the tongue. Well, I inherited that trait. I come by it honestly. My grandmother, my mother's mother, and mom, if you're watching, <laughs> she's going to get chuckle out of this because she knows I'm telling the truth. My mother's mother was famous for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. One time she was at a funeral for a lady from our church that I grew up in, and she went to the lady's son, who of course was crying and grieving and he was, you know, sad that his mom had passed and looked all down face. And my grandmother proceeded to say to him, Nori, for heaven's sakes, you look like death warmed over. <laughs> well, needless to say, that wasn't necessarily the, wise, the wisest thing to say at that moment in time. But it's all about timing sometimes. Sometimes the Word of God tells us in our passage today that when the fullness of time was come, when God's appointed moment had arrived, that's when God sent forth His Son into the world at the exact right time. Well, now that sounds good on paper. But when you look at the historic evidence, you might ask yourself, why on earth now? Lord, why in the world would you have come to earth now? Why did God reveal himself to humanity at that moment in human history? And some of you... If you don't know history real well, or biblical history, you might not under understand my point. The Romans had colonized all of Palestine. All of the Jewish Israel was colonized by the Romans. The Romans controlled the majority of the known world. The Jewish people were not able to practice their religion as freely as they would like. They were not able to do all the things that they knew to do and that they wanted to do. The situation politically was not at all ideal. It was not a perfect time for God to reveal himself. Or so you would think if you just look at the picture from a historical perspective. If you really look at the time that Jesus came in, you might say to yourself, why on earth now? Lord, what, what was going on in your head? Why, why, you could have come when Israel was in possession of its own land, when they controlled their own country, when their religion was in full swing, and the sacrifices were occurring in the temple, and everything was flowing beautifully and easily. Lord, you could have come and revealed yourself at a time when things were so much better and everything was cheerful and positive and good. But why on earth now? Why, why did 
did you choose to come to earth at this point mm -hmm. in human history? Jesus came into the world of humanity at such a difficult time in human history. Israel was in a situation that was disheartening and desperate. The land of promise had been taken over and colonized by the ruthless, godless Romans. Idolaters, violent and immoral. They were brutes and they were ruling the people of God. Why in the world, Lisa, would the Lord choose to come to earth to fulfill the mission of salvation at such a desperate and dark hour as this? The truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ came at a difficult hour for the people of God, but the time was ideal, listen to me now, for the God of the people. <laughs> you see, sometimes... When we are going through a period that is difficult, listen now, if this don't make you want to get Pentecostal real quick and shout, then nothing will. Sometimes when things are going really bad and really tough for the people of God, the situation is ideal for the God of the people. <laughs> Hallelujah! Jesus came at an hour when the people of God were in a desperate time. They were in a dark time. They were not a happy people. But God looked at that situation and said, this is my perfect time. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, those of you like myself who are a little depressed and a little upset and a little unhappy about a moron in the White House. Oh, children, don't you worry about how difficult a time you and I are in. This may be a bad time for us, but it's a good time for God. Hallelujah! Oh, I'm here to tell you, God wants to do something. Glory to God. Phew. Oh, I want to sit and shout about that a little while, but I don't have the energy. <laughs> the very circumstances which would seem to have made that particular moment in history inopportune were the very circumstances which the Lord would use to help carry out his plan. Did you hear what I just said? The same circumstances that would make that time in history appear to be the wrong time for Jesus to come. Those same circumstances were the circumstances that would help the Lord to achieve his ends. I've got news for you today. You know how tough things are right now? You know how we all feel like we're living in a vice? You know how our minds feel like they've been tossed in a blender and the blender been turned on puree and we're all struggling to keep our sanity day to day? I got news for you. It's these very circumstances that God is able to use to bring revival and restoration to the last day church. All oh, children, God couldn't do anything like he wants to do except we were going down this path we're going down right now. Right. This is not a bad time for God. It may appear a bad time for us. But it's the perfect time for God. Amen. Amen, amen. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. It is folly today to think that God has not well thought out his plans. When we look upon circumstances in our world, and we erroneously believe that God is somehow temporarily out of control, we are wrong. Even in the darkest hours of the night, our God knows what he's doing, Martin. Hallelujah. His sight is not hindered. His vision is not obstructed by the darkness that blinds us. 
Just because it's dark and we can't see the forest for the trees. Just because it's dark and we can't see what's coming tomorrow. Don't you think for a minute God can? Right. Hallelujah. Yes. He still knows what he's doing. He still has a plan. He still is in control. The Lord used... The, listen now, this, this is important. I'm going to tell you, it's amazing to me. The longer I live, the more the Word of God comes alive. Uh -huh. Because there are things that I've read in the Word of God that the longer I live, the more and more I see the church emulating every single thing I saw about Israel in Scripture. Mm -hmm. The Lord used the carnality and earthly ambitions of the Jewish leadership to bring about His plan. Did you hear that now? Oh, yeah. When the Lord came to earth, He was able to use the Jews' carnality and earthly ambitions in order to achieve His ends. I'll tell you a little secret. There's never been a time in history when the church has been more carnal and full of more earthly ambitions than it is right now. Mm, that's the truth. There's never been a time in human history. Yeah. But God has a plan. And I've got news for you. He's going to use that carnality. He's going to use those earthly ambitions in order to bring about his plan. I'm going to tell you a little secret. In the next 10 years, the face of Christianity in America is going to change and it's going to change drastically. Mm -hmm. The fundamentalist evangelical movements have revealed themselves for the political whores that they are. Yes, they have. I said it, for the political whores that they are. Willing to get into bed with politicians. Willing to get into bed with political worldly leaders in order to achieve its ends. God don't need politicians. God don't need worldly leaders. That's right. When the people of Israel turned to the politicians and turned to the worldly leaders, what were they trying to do? They were trying to crucify Jesus. Mm -hmm. The only good part of that is crucifying Jesus was in the plan. Yes. Yes. Amen. So God used their carnality. He used their whoredom with the, po the political leaders. He used that to his advantage in order to bring about his plan. Well, I've got news for you. God has a plan for the last days. And that plan involves revival. That plan involves restoration. That plan involves inclusivity, inclusiveness, and affirmation. In the next 10 years, the face of the Christian church is going to change drastically because people today are seeing what the evangelical and the fundamentalist churches are really all about and what their real ambitions are and what their real desires are. They don't have an interest in the world in God or God's plan. They haven't got an interest in the world in anything that has to do with God. What they're interested in is worldly power and worldly influence and trying to control the minds and hearts and lives of people. Mm -hmm. Half the so-called leaders in the evangelical and the fundamentalist movements today are richer than most of us will ever dream of being. Mm -hmm. And they're more interested in supporting an agenda and a political platform that protects their wealth than they are obeying the Word of God and doing things the way the Word of God teaches for it to be done. Am I telling the truth today? Oh, I'm going to tell you something. God is using this circumstance today to achieve His ends. He is tearing the mask off of the fundamentalists and off of the evangelical movements. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. Ten years from now, the very evangelical churches, the very fundamentalist churches that are full up today are going to be empty. And the affirming and inclusive churches that you see today that have a hard time filling up are going to be full up. Hallelujah. Because the face of Christianity in America is about to change. People are exiting the judgmental, critical, nasty church.
churches. They have seen with their own eyes. My pastor doesn't care about the move of God. He doesn't care about the salvation of souls. All he's interested in is politics. All he's interested in is worldly influence. All he's interested in is money. Bill, that's our opportunity. That's our opportunity. That's our opportunity to reach out to people and say, hey, guess what? We got a church that ain't interested in none of those things. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. We're too busy doing the kingdom work to be worried about a worldly work. Yes. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. We have an opportunity. So no matter how dark it appears to us, no matter how much... Our current circumstance may appear to be overwhelming. God has a plan. And he is going to use this circumstance to achieve his purpose. The Lord used the carnality and earthly ambitions of Jewish leadership in his day to bring about his plan. The Jewish people, and particularly the religious leaders of that day, wanted a Messiah who would come and deliver the people of God from their subservience to Rome. They wanted a political leader, a warrior, a mighty champion. Their eyes were on their earthly circumstance. They had lost sight of the issues that the law addressed. The law of Moses was designed to set Israel apart from other nations. It was designed to focus the worship of Israel on that one true and living God that Moses met and conversed with on Mount Sinai. It was designed to address the issue of sin and to empower God's people to walk in His blessing and in His approval. But the Jewish leadership of the Lord's day was focused on their temporal circumstance. And they could not see the need for a Messiah and a Savior who would defeat their spiritual enemy and fight their spiritual battle. They couldn't see the need for a Messiah that would defeat sin and leave death itself bleeding and dead upon the ground at Mount Calvary. They could not see the forest for the trees. They could not see what was needed to be done in the spiritual realm because they were so focused on what they saw as needing to be done in the temporal realm. I'm going to tell you a little secret. We're under that threat right now, folks. If we're not careful, and the preacher's preaching to the preacher too, if we're not careful, we'll get so caught up in this foolishness that's going on right now that we're going to lose sight of what God wants to do in the Spirit. And we can't afford to do that. We cannot afford to allow ourselves to become like the Jewish leaders and the elders in the Lord's day and to become so focused on our current circumstance that we lose sight of what God's plan is and what God is trying to do. Amen. In Romans 8, verse 7, 9, verse 17, the word of the Lord tells us, let me see if I have it up. No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might, de de might be declared throughout the earth. God raised up Pharaoh to oppose Moses. God made sure that by the time Moses was ready to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, that the leadership in Egypt would be contrary. Talk about bad timing. Talk about... Why on earth now? Lord, why on earth now would you have a Pharaoh? Why don't you have a Pharaoh in place who'll just say, Okay, Moses, you want to take the Jews? Go right ahead. Have a good time. No. Why would you 
allow and why would you set up a Pharaoh who is going to be contrary to the release of the Jewish people? Well, it's easy because God had something in the spiritual realm he was trying to get done. And he couldn't have gotten it done if there was an agreeable Pharaoh on the throne. He needed a disagreeable Pharaoh because you know what God did? He sent plagues in order to reveal himself. In order to reveal himself. Listen to me now. He sent plagues. Each and every one of those plagues spit in the face of an individual Egyptian deity. Each of those plagues literally spit in the face of an Egyptian deity. So God said, no, I could get you all out of Egypt a whole lot quicker. But in the process, I wouldn't reveal myself as being the only one and true living God. So I've got a plan that involves your getting out and me revealing myself as the one true and only living God. Hallelujah. So even though in Moses' day, he might have looked at the Lord and said, Lord, this isn't the right time. Lord, the timing ain't right. Things aren't good right now. While the Pharaoh up there in, in Egypt, uh, he, he ain't going to be agreeable to the people of God being let loose. That's all right, Moses. I got a plan. It doesn't matter how dark things look. It doesn't matter how contrary things look. It doesn't matter how you look at your temporal circumstance and all you see is opposition and trouble and darkness. I have a plan, and I'm going to use this circumstance to achieve my ends. Oh, I want to tell you what the Holy Ghost has spoken to my heart. God has said, don't you worry <laughs> about how dark things look right now. Don't you worry about how contrary things look right now. I have a plan. Hallelujah. I'm going to use the very circumstances that are driving you out of your mind to bring revival and restoration to millions. Hallelujah. We too today are in such a situation. Many of the most powerful and influential ministers in our nation and indeed in the world have lost sight of the spiritual warfare that we ought to be waging. And instead, they are addressing issues that are base, carnal, and of the flesh. They can no more see the plan of God than they can see God himself. They've lost sight of the benefits and purposes of God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. The gospel today is lost on so many who claim to be adherents to that same gospel. The same was true of the Jewish people and the Hebrew religious leadership in the Lord's day. Their eyes were firmly fixed upon the world in which they lived and their perceived need to fix that world. But they lost sight entirely, Martin, of the fact that their job was not to change the world in which they lived, but to secure a place in a far better world. When this short vapor of a life had ended. See, it's not our job to change the world. It's our job to secure the next world. Hallelujah. That's our job. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, I have it on the screen in front of you. The Word of God declares, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. There are distractions that can Get us, if we're not careful, Paul said. He said, let us lay aside the weights. Let us lay aside the sin. These things, listen, looking at the world through carnal eyes is sin. 
The Bible said if you're in the flesh, you cannot please God. So if you're focused on this world, if you're focused on this life, if you're focused on things going on here, honey, i got news for you. It is impossible for you to please God. In order to please God, you got to be in the spirit. If you're in the spirit, you're focused on spiritual things, not carnal things. You're focused on heavenly things, not earthly things. You're focused on divine things, not worldly things. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. He said, let us lay aside the weight, the sin, which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The Word of God said Jesus endured the contradiction of sinners. But you know what's funny? Those who caused the Lord the most grief were the most religious. Yes. But God says they were sinners. Honey, you can have all the religion in the world and still be the biggest sinner in town. That's right. You can be the biggest evangelical. You can be the biggest fundamentalist. You can be the biggest name. You can be the biggest preacher. You can be the biggest Christian celebrity that ever walked planet Earth and still be the biggest sinner that ever walked the planet. The only person your false spirituality is fooling is yourself. And there's a little saying, birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. The only people fooled by false spirituality are people who are walking in false spirituality. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. If you look at the example Paul said in Hebrews, if you look at the example of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, from the very earliest part of his life, he was already setting an example for us. Look at Luke chapter 2, verses 42 through 49. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. I'm so glad Jesus listens. He don't just talk. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad my God listens. He doesn't just talk. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, meaning Mary and Joseph, they were amazed and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, Listen, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? From his earliest days, Jesus was focused on the plan at hand. 
From his earliest days, Martin, he was not focused on his present circumstance. He was not pre he was not in the present. He was not sitting there looking at everything that was going on at that moment in time. Oh, Mom and Joseph, they're headed back to home. I need to get ready to go with them. No, no, no. He was so focused on doing what God had set him there to do. He was so focused on doing what he was meant to do that he wasn't even mindful. And when his parents when his, his stepdad and his mom showed up and they said, well, why in the world have you done this to us? What are you talking about done this to you? I could have done nothing to you. What did I do to you? You're acting like I did this. Son. You ever had your parents come at you like, you know, you, you've done something? Well, you're, why did you do this to me? What do you mean do this to you? I didn't do this to you. I did it. <laughs> I didn't do it to you. It's not like I had you in mind when I did it. But that's how Mary, good Jewish mother, you know, guilt. Yeah. Why have you done this to your father and I? What's up with you? Why is this? What's going on here, you know? You little shish kebab. I don't know any Yiddish terms, so I use shish kebab. <clears throat> Why have you done this to us? He says, Why would you even be looking for me? Why, why would you even be worried about me? You know I'm focused on doing my father's business. Children, I'm here to tell you today, don't get too caught up in this Trump foolishness. Don't get too caught up in our political environment today. Don't get too caught up in this. God has a plan. That plan is revival. God has a plan. That plan is to save souls. God has a plan. That plan is to, to bring restoration and healing to people who have been pushed out of the church, who have been disenfranchised, who have been disowned. God has a plan. Let's stay focused on the plan. Hallelujah. Let's stay focused on the things which are spiritual and not the things which are carnal. Because if we're not careful, we're going to get bogged down with our with everything that's going on in our world today and we're going to lose sight of God's plan. We're going to lose sight of what God is trying to do in the spiritual realms. And if we lose sight of those things, we won't be part of those things can't be part of something if you're not looking for it, watching for it. Amen. The Word of God tells us today, Paul admonishes us here in Hebrews to keep our focus and to set our eyes upon the price, not allowing ourselves to become distracted by the things of this life. We cannot make heaven our final home if we're focused on making earth a more livable place. Did you hear what I just said? Oh, yeah. We cannot make heaven our eternal home if we're focused on making earth a more livable place. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Jesus was the prime example of one who would not allow for one moment the circumstances of this life to distract him from his purpose and his objectives. He could have easily become so burdened by that which was happening in Israel that he could have decided to change course and to seek to be what the people of Israel wanted him to be instead of what his father desired him to be. We risk this same distraction today. We too can become so focused on our temporal existence and earthly circumstance that we lose sight of our spiritual objectives and our heavenly ambitions to please God and to walk in divine fellowship with Him as sons and daughters. We can lose sight of that if we're not careful if we get too busy focusing on what's happening around us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses number, I think it's 3 through 10. I can barely read the numbers. I apologize. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, 
Yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. <clears throat> Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. So in other words, my circumstance is one thing. But in the spirit... Things are very different. Something else is happening in the spirit. He said, sometimes I suffer as an evildoer, even to the point that I'm in prison. He said, but the word of God isn't in prison. Hallelujah. No matter what's happening in the world around us, that is not affecting God. That is not affecting the spirit of God. That is not affecting the word of God. That is not affecting the plan of God. Don't lose sight of that. He said, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Hallelujah to God. Oh, we got to stay focused on spiritual things. we got to, listen, there are people out there today dying without God. There are people out there today who are lost, who have never been saved. There are people out there, especially in our community today, who are backslid, who are headed to a devil's hell, all because somebody convinced them of a wrong message. Somebody told them an untruth about this gospel. We cannot afford to get distracted. We cannot afford to get bogged down with what's going on in the world. We've got to stay focused on our mission. We've got to stay focused on spiritual things. The Word of God also tells us today in 2 Corinthians okay, chapter 10. Um, yeah, actually, this is the passage I just read to you a minute ago. Tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In spite of what is happening today in our world and particularly in our country, we must remain focused. We can still believe God for revival. We can still seek the Lord to be used of God, to be a witness and a testimony before a sin-sick and dying world. We can still seek to experience the, uh, and manifest the supernatural power of a living God. We can still seek to win souls and to demonstrate the truth of God, the love of God, the grace of God. We cannot afford to become distracted. I'm telling you, this message is for me as much as for anybody. I'm being honest because I'm telling you the way things have been going lately, it's enough to just about give you tunnel vision where that's all you see and that's all you can look at. Yes. But the Holy Ghost this week gave me this message for a reason. Yes. said, why on earth now? Lord, why on earth Why on earth now are we dealing with the stuff we're dealing with? Because I told you there was going to be a last day revival. And in order to achieve that, you got to walk this path. 
In order to get where I'm trying to get the church to go, I've got to pull the mask off of the fundamentalists. I've got to pull the mask off of the evangelicals. In order to get the church to get back to the place where it understands love, to get back to the place where it understands affirmation, where it gets to the place where it understands that judgment and criticism and negativity have no place in the church of God. In order to get there, we got to go through here. It's not an easy thing to go through, but we got to go through here. So while you're going through here, just stay focused on the spiritual things. Just stay focused on my plan. Just stay focused on my objective. Don't get caught up in your present circumstance. Our God is able today to use our present circumstance to work His divine purpose and His plan. He can and will empty the bigoted, hateful, condemnatory, and legalistic churches. Hallelujah. Ain't that an exciting thought? I said he can and he will empty those churches. While at the same time, he will fill those churches which embrace the truths of love, grace, justice, and inclusion. We can be the agents used of God to usher in the last day revival that will make ready millions of human hearts for the soon coming arrival of our King at the rapture of the church. This is what God has said is coming in the last days. In Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 7, Reading, uh, excuse me, 17, reading through verse 21. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. This is what we should be focused on today, not Trump. This is what we should be focused on today, not the GOP. This is what we should be focused on today, not Washington, D.C. Hallelujah. We should be focused on what God has promised is coming. And he said, I'm going to pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Hallelujah. And it's going to come to pass that whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. We got revival in the works, folks. I don't know about you, but I want to be focused on revival. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to have my vision fixed Amen. on. Because I want to be part of that. Amen. I'm closing this afternoon, believe it or not. My final passage that I want to share with you today. I believe it's 2 Corinthians. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's terrible getting old. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I guess I don't have it up there. Yeah, I do. Yes, I do. Okay, Galatians, I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. The older you get, the worse it gets, isn't it, Lisa? I'm yeah. telling you. If I don't have them readers on my face, Johnny, I'm blind as the bat. <laughs> Galatians 6, 7 through 9, my final scripture today. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth, listen, to his flesh 
shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Pastor Charles, why for 25 years have you been ministering in the LGBT community with as few people as you've got in your church after all these years? Why do you keep going? Why do you even bother? Why didn't you quit decades ago? Believe me, the temptation was there and the enemy tried to get me to many, many, many times. Why haven't I stopped? I'll tell you why in a nutshell. I believe the Word of God. I don't believe the enemy. I believe the Word of God. I can either get in the flesh and be affected by my circumstance. I can either get in the flesh and allow what I see around me to determine what I believe. Or I can believe the Word of God. My Bible tells me that if I keep working, I'm going to reap. Hallelujah. That as long as I don't faint, one day, somewhere, somehow, we're going to see that sickle fall and we're going to reap a harvest. Hallelujah. I still believe that one day we're going to walk into this building and there's going to be more people coming to church than we can handle. Hallelujah. I still believe one day, Martin, the day is coming when we're going to try to get up in here and if you're late for church, you're going to have to just listen from the outside because God is going to fill this place up. I'm still believing the Word of God. I can't get focused on earthly things. I can't get focused on carnal things. I can't get focused on what I see with my natural eye. I've got to stay focused in the Spirit. I've got to stay focused on the plan of God, on the promises of God. And God has promised revival. He said, I'm going to pour my Spirit out in the last days. I'm still waiting on that. I know I might be foolish. If it never comes, well, then I just stood here and believed God for nothing. But I'll tell you, I've lived for the Lord long enough to know that what God promises, He's also able to perform. Amen. And without fail, when God says it, He delivers on it. So when we ask ourselves today, why on earth now, Lord? Why are things happening right now the way they're happening? Why did you come to earth when you came? Because I had a plan. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, that circumstance that has you troubled, that situation that has your heart disturbed, that very circumstance is going to help me achieve my plan mm -hmm. and my end. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. Y'all are blessed today because... I kept that.